So what about cross-linguistic morphological developments? So English is fairly impoverished morphologically. We don't have lots of different morphing bits that we add on to words. A lot more of our, our work has comes from rearranging words in different orders. Um, so English is poor morphologically. When compared to languages like Hungarian, where, for example, the uh, noun phrase the goblin may have up to 16 different forms depending on what the goblin's role in the sentence actually is, right? Morphology will tell you that information. So how does this affect morphological development? Well, it turns out it's not really about how much morphology you have. So a morphologically rich language like Hungarian is not necessarily harder for kids to figure out than a morphologically poor one like English. Rather, the important dimension is predictability or regularity. So regular and predictable systems are easier for children to learn than languages that have exceptions, like English often does. For example, if we think about the past tense in English, there's a, a regular predictable form, which is that ED, which we may pronounce different ways, but we laughed, we hugged, we danced. But then there are these exceptions. We don't say we singed and we run. We have these other forms. We sang and we ran, right? So that's an exception. That's not predictable, so that's harder to learn. And so if we consider, for example, a, a morphologically rich language like Turkish, which is in fact very regular, there are not very many exceptions. And so the inflected forms seem no harder for Turkish children to acquire. In fact, they often produce inflected forms equivalent to producing the word laugh with that ed ending, that past tense ending. They produce the inflected forms before they even combine words in multiple utterances. They're already adding on that morphology because the morphology is predictable and regular. It doesn't matter that there's a lot of it. It matters that it's predictable and there aren't a lot of exceptions. So there are other factors that also help make morphology easier to learn uh, besides predictability. But for example, uh, high frequency, like what you might expect, the more you hear something, the easier it is to learn. More frequent morphemes are easier to learn. Uh, the regularity in the form itself. So remember, in English, uh, we might have, for example, that, that plural endings might be pronounced uh, x as in cats, z as in dogs, or z as in glasses, right? That's not very regular, that's variation, right? Having a regular form, the morpheme always being the same, that's easier to learn. Having a fixed position relative to the stem is easier to learn. So if the morpheme always attaches as a suffix at the end of the word or as a prefix at the beginning of the word, that's easier, right? And English does have that for, for most of its morphology. Uh, if the morphology is easy to recognize as separate from the stem, that's easier too. So laughing, that ing is an entire syllable, so it's easier to recognize uh, phon phonologically. If you don't know how the words break down yet, it's easier to recognize as this commonly reoccurring piece. So that helps. And if the rhythm of the language makes the morpheme perceptually salient because it receives stress, then that's also something that's going to make it easier to learn. So there are lots of other things that can help. And you know, English uses some, lots of languages use some of them, but these can help predict which morphemes are going to be acquired first, you know, depending on how they fall on this continuum of different properties.